everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're really happy to welcome Rachel Bolstead, um, who's one of our very own here in New Zealand and has done a lot of work with quite a large amount of the Twitter crowd, I believe. Um, very welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn off the screen share so you can introduce, give it a bit of a wave. Um, just a reminder to everybody who might be watching tonight on all the various platforms um, that um, we will be having time for questions at the end, so please feel free to put them on the Hangout page, um, but also tweet your questions, and we'll be monitoring both the EdChatNZ hashtag and the EdChatNZ MOOC hashtag if you want to join and part of the conversation. Um, so to get ourselves started, uh, Rachel, do you want to talk to us a little bit about yourself, where you fit in the education landscape, and how you got interested in education futures? Okay, so um, I'm a senior researcher at the New Zealand Council for Educational Research, and I've been there coming up on 15 years now, and um, through my work at NZCER, I guess I have explored a really broad range of um, research questions and focuses um, that cover the whole span of how we think about education in New Zealand, um, from thinking about what's going on in the school sector, thinking about the nature of curriculum and how it's evolving, um, through to thinking about the relationship between the education sector and other parts of society. So um, it's really interesting work. And because the projects are always changing, um, that's I guess that's why I've been able to sort of stay in that role for such a long time, because I feel like I'm still constantly always learning something new through the work that I do. So, and I love to learn. And I guess that's what attracted me into working in education in the first place, um, because I think it's just endlessly fascinating I listened to your podcast with um, Pete Hall this morning um, and that was something that came up in there as well is that you talked about how much you enjoy learning and actually as a researcher um, how important learning is and what you do. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think, I mean, we'll start talking about the game in a little while, but I think one of the things that I've always felt as a researcher, it's kind of like that my job is to... Um, go out there and kind of explore what's going on and read literature and um, do research and kind of sift through all of that knowledge and try and extract some useful meaning out of it and then, you know, making that knowledge accessible to other people. Um, but I've always felt like that it's, it's almost impossible to translate all of the learning that happens to you as the person doing the research. Um, you know, I feel like you only have a able to convey um, a part of that learning through the way that we disseminate research. And so that's why I'm really yeah. interested in supporting other people to, to think in research early ways, because I think that's where the real kind of exciting, fun, powerful kind of mind shifting learning happens. It's not from, it's not always just from reading research that someone else has done. What do you mean with supporting others to think or to learn in researcherly ways? Can you unpack that a little bit more for us, please? Yeah, I guess um, I was talking to somebody about this recently, but I think thinking in a researcherly, researcherly way starts with, um, you know, finding your way to questions that you, you genuinely don't know the answers to. <clears throat> and that's, I think the most powerful starting point of research is actually finding your way to the, to the really important and interesting questions to ask. Um, and I think that that's something that everybody's capable of doing because of course the, the questions that we should be asking really depend on, you know, the context that we're working in or what our job is or, you know, what kind of work we're, we're trying to do in the world. And so sometimes, um, you know, finding your way to the to the best question to ask actually is the start of the thinking process that then can drive a researcherly approach to your work. Um, so it's not just I think there's a there's a real focus 
in the ether at the moment around using data and being sort of data driven, using evidence to to guide decisions. Um, but as a researcher, I think that we need to never forget that actually it starts from knowing what are the questions we want to ask. You know, data in itself isn't going to reveal truths. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make um, sense? I think that you, there's something that you've touched on is around those asking questions that we genuinely don't know the answers to. And it's a passion and a trend that's come up in, I think, pretty much every one of the webinars we've had so far is about that uncertainty mm. and being okay with uncertainty. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I actually, I mean, I think sometimes people who I've worked with have said they enjoy, you know, if people, if I'm doing uh, research with a school, with a group of teachers, often people then will say that they've really enjoyed being part of the process. And part of that is because of the kinds of questions that we might ask them as um, coming in with kind of our researcher hat on. Um, and it, But those questions actually help people to kind of think about their own work in a different way. And, you know, and I, I feel like I don't always, it's not that I deliberately set out to ask those powerful questions. It's because I genuinely am curious and I want to know and, you know, and I ask the questions that I don't know the answers to. And sometimes the person I'm asking doesn't know either, but it's in the sort of thinking and talking through that um, you kind of get to a new place in your thinking. And that's cool. Yeah. Um, Steve Mouldy and I often joke about, um, you know, you've asked a good question on Twitter um, when you stop the whole feed from going crazy, like that night that Rachel did it, <laughs> <laughs> that that's that's kind mm. of become the yardstick. Is it's not a good question until you've made it stop the way Rachel has. Um, no. I don't know if you remember that question. Yeah, I do remember that question. Yeah, um, that was about thinking about a hundred years. What are we doing to prepare for the learner in hundred years? Yeah, which was the question that I I heard asked, or, or that the idea came from somebody that I was interviewing, um, in, yeah. a, in a piece of research that I'd just been doing recently, and, and the thought struck me in that way as well. And so, you know, because it was um, such a profound and interesting way to think about our purpose, you know, like most of us think we, we're not that good at thinking on those really long time spans, or at least we, it's far to connect our own everyday actions to where things might be in a hundred years yeah. and yeah. So I was just sharing it on as a good <laughs> researcher does. Um, that leads us in quite nicely. Um, so what's the value in thinking about curriculum for or in the future? Why might we choose to do so? Yeah, well, um, how, how it, how I got into thinking about the curriculum for the future is probably from, it started out just with thinking about the curriculum as it is now and really unpacking um, how it came to be the way it is now and how it's changed over time. So uh, in the course of my work, I've done um, various pieces of contract research. Um, and some of that was during the time prior to the development of the New Zealand curriculum. So um, I did a background paper that was all about school-based curriculum development. Uh, and I did another one <clears throat> that was about the shifting tides of the senior secondary curriculum. So both of those were pieces of work commissioned by Ministry of Education to inform their thinking as they were developing the New Zealand curriculum. So I guess the request from those pieces of work was to say, you know, can you do some research that will help us think about the future directions we should be going in or what are the trends and what are the shifts and so I delve really really deep into um, these questions about you know well how have we come to sort of make these decisions around you know the learning areas and um, why why do these particular areas exist in our curriculum whereas there's other kind of disciplines or knowledge that's not there and you know, how did all that come about? And um, the deeper you kind of unpack those questions, the more it comes down to those much bigger questions around, you know, what are we trying to achieve with education? And um, how how do we decide what's important to learn? And what, what do we 
how do we kind of determine that as a society? Because in a way, you know, a curriculum is trying to serve many different needs and prepare people for all sorts of different, you know, futures and lives. And, you know, we have a national curriculum. So at some, to some degree, you know, that's a public statement that we've, you know, made some choices about things that we think everybody should have the opportunity to learn. So how did we make those decisions? Um, and what are the different ideas that are woven into the curriculum documents we have and how might those be different? So thinking about um, curriculum for the future, the future is, is that kind of unknown space. It's the, the time that doesn't exist yet. So in a way, it's it's the perfect foil for thinking about just the question of curriculum in general and our present curriculum through, through a new lens. So in thinking about our, our current curriculum and future curriculums through a new lens, what, why would your average classroom teacher or even students, because I know there are students playing the curriculum for the future game as well. Um, why why would we get them to engage with thinking about the curriculum through different lenses? Yeah, well, I think t when I think about it, I think about the curriculum. I mean, there's multiple layers of what a curriculum is. So, of course, we've got our, our document, our New Zealand curriculum document, which sort of sets out what is, you know, what do we believe learning in the New Zealand school sector ought to comprise and look like. But, you know, the document itself has never taught any, anybody anything, you know. It has to be interpreted and um, used by teachers and, and schools to create opportunities for students to learn. And so and in that process, you know, that's curriculum design as well. Um, and also... You know, and I think it's not just teachers that shape those learning opportunities. It's also um, the community and its expectations of schooling. So, so that's why I think those questions are important because um, anyone who, who's contributing to what kids actually learn or have the opportunities to learn is designing curriculum. So we might as well be, you know, cognizant and conscious about um, about that process and not just kind of see a document as a you know, this is what it is and this is what it shall be, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So well, how did could this thinking about curriculum turn into a game? Because that, that for a lot of um, researchers, that's not the usual direction that they go in. You know, we have some unfortunate stereotypes about researchers and this definitely doesn't, smashes that to pieces essentially. Yeah, so I guess it started, it's going back a few years ago now and myself um, and some of the colleagues that I was working with at the time, so it's um, Sue McDowell and Ali Bull and Jane Gilbert and we were working on a project and I think the project was called Curriculum for the Future and we, we kind of talked around and around in circles in this project team about what it was that we were trying to achieve. And I think it's, again, because, you know, we're in this territory, you're wrestling with really um, complex questions around, um, you know, how does the research that we do that goes like deeply into curriculum theory, how do we then turn that into resources or reports or something that, you know, people can use yeah. to think with. So, at a certain point, um, I think Sue and I just, you know, the idea kind of struck us that we wanted to do something that was interactive and we wanted, we were playing around with different ideas around setting up um, kind of like mock debates where I think one of our original ideas was to set up a situation where people would create a little scenario in which, you know, a hypothetical um future in which it was decided that we had to drop one of the learning areas out of our curriculum and the idea was that we would then get people to debate and defend you know why is their learning area important and what does it contribute to people's learning and to people's lives um, and so we kind of thought about that idea for a while and then we kind of stepped a little bit further out from that and thought rather than having people kind of 
defending um, a learning area or defending a way of thinking about teaching and learning that they might feel quite invested in, what if we took that role play process even further? And so that's where the first uh, version of curriculum for the future emerged. So the original version is a workshop game and it's um, a set of instructions that tells tells you how to set up kind of like this mock debate between curriculum ideas, but the curriculum ideas are much more out there. So um, the role play game, we've played it with lots of different groups and there's probably about 10 or 12 different curriculum ideas that could be played in that game. And they include things like the AI curriculum, which is also made it into the digital game. <laughs> Um, yep. Or there's one one idea that, you know, all learning should happen through the arts. Um, or there's another idea that the curriculum should be locally developed. So every community would, you know, shape a curriculum that meets their particular local needs. So in the first version of the game, all these different ideas are kind of competing to say who can kind of make the best case. And in doing that, um, people can take on an idea that's not necessarily one that they personally are deeply invested in, but they can just play mm -hmm. with the possibilities. Um, and I think that's why we really wanted to go down the game design pathway was that, you know, by making something into a game, you're kind of giving people license to be playful and to um, just explore ideas without feeling that they have to be really invested in the outcome or that they have to know the right answer or that the game has to lead to an immediate, clear kind of outcome or next step. Yeah. I think one yeah. of the things that um, certainly comes up in many of the kind of discussions on Twitter and in other places where there are people who are a little bit more future oriented, we're keen to try things who might be a little bit more comfortable with that uncertainty that they often struggle to find ways to engage other people in their schools or mm. um, families in, in thinking in the space of the unknown and thinking about, um, and I guess teachers in particular are a great example where without a doubt there are thousands of teachers across New Zealand and the world over who are so invested in these students they genuinely care so being able to let go of that can be a real challenge if you're being asked to step and all of a sudden think about the future and what do I need to change now when you're already so invested so I think there's just some real value in thinking about gaming in that space then, isn't there? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I really wanted the game to be feel like something that just frees people up to be playful and creative because I think when you create those conditions, um, really amazing, powerful thinking comes into the space. And I, know, and I say that knowing that I've seen that happen like time after time when we've played that role yeah. play game with people. Um, another kind of idea that sat underneath the way that we designed the game, both versions, the role play game and the, yeah. the digital game, is that we wanted it to be a resource that people could engage with together who wouldn't normally necessarily participate in a conversation together about the curriculum. So, for example, um, it was really important to us that we could imagine that students and teachers and people from the community um, might all actually be able to play that game together because it didn't matter you know normally there's um, some quite clear um, power differences and you know authority around curriculum and it's not something that say students for example would you wouldn't necessarily yeah. think a lot of the time that they've got something to contribute because you know, perhaps um, we tend to think of the curriculum as something we design for learners, not with them. So that was yeah. um, that was kind of an idea behind the design and then in the development of the role play game. <coughs> excuse me, my cold. Um, right. We actually tested it with with mixed groups and found that it was really successful, um, and that students in particular really enjoyed um, the opportunity to 
be able to think about the curriculum, um, which wasn't something that they necessarily ha had thought about or had had their opinions solicited about before. That in itself is interesting that the students engage with these ideas, but that it's not a space where we do engage them a whole lot always. Hmm. I know yeah, these, one um, of the ideas in, in the game, in both versions of the game, is a proposition about co-developing the curriculum with students. Um, and it's, it's amazing how often when that game, when that curriculum idea is played, um, that one often is the winning idea. Interesting. Which is, is fun, yeah. Uh, I, we've got a student at my school um, who's found the Twitter world of teachers um, and has become quite passionate about education and actually talking to teachers about leadership in schools and curriculum design and and he totally holds his own. It's pretty mm. incredible, um, which really has had me question why don't we involve our students more at more levels when they actually, I think he holds his own better than a lot of teachers I've spoken to, you know. Mm. So why is it that we don't involve the people who are at the heart of this mm. more. Yeah. Well, I think it's, um, you know, as a researcher, I've been really lucky in that I often get to go and interview students and um, kind of seek their views about what's going on in their teaching and learning. And, you know, I've never been, um, I'm, I'm constantly amazed by how much students have to offer like really insightful stuff around you know their own learning and lives and of course it makes perfect sense because you know they are the people closest to the situation you know of course they're going to have a really um, useful perspective and insight into into their own lives into their own learning so we've talked a bit about this idea of the game allowing playing with possibility um, and about how it kind of allows people to step outside their normal day-to-day -day and things they might already be really invested in. Mm. Um, what are some of the limitations of doing this with a game? I think a lot of it has to do with um, expectations and, and what people expect that they should or could get out of an experience like you know either the experience of playing a game like curriculum for the future or what their expectations are um, because this is a resource produced by a, a research organization and you know people um, perhaps want to know you know what is the message of this game or what should I do with it or um, what ideas was I supposed to get from it and I think that's where that that's kind of where the tension has always been with the game because um sorry my cat may jump on my lap <laughs> that's okay <laughs> um, it, it's it's genuinely designed to be something that opens up thinking and opens up discussion and there's a lot of really um useful kind of ideas in the game that can be taken in many different directions and we as the game designers don't think that there's a one single right way to use the game or a right one single right um, message to take from the game. It's, you know, it's multiple different pathways and in, in, in learnings that you could take from it. And so I think getting that across to people um, in a way that they feel comfortable that they can just allow themselves to engage with the game and, you know, they can be puzzled by it or they can be frustrated by it um, and they can wonder, well, what was, you know, what were the designers trying to achieve with this game? Um, and all of those are legitimate and, and useful responses to the game, um, just as the responses that other people may have where they sort of, you know, they take away an idea um, from the game or they have fun playing it or you know they respond to one of the questions that comes up in the game and think well I haven't really thought about that before and they carry that question away with them so to that yeah. I forgot what your original question was but <laughs> um some of the limitations yeah I mean not everybody right away will you know sometimes um well the, the original game is a role play game and sometimes 
you just say role play and some people are already, you know, they've left the room or they're hiding in the corner because they feel um, uncomfortable about the idea. But it's a, it's a really low level role play. It's not asking people to, to act or to improvise. It's, it's really just creating a scenario that gives yeah. people a reason to um, explore some different kinds of questions. So, and actually once people start playing, they usually really get into it. So, <laughs> and often people just seize control of the game and take it in other directions too, which is cool. That's very cool. Um, mm. On the online game, um, it really highlights different perspectives that people might have in response to alternative curriculums. Why the focus on perspectives? Yeah, so well, there's kind of, there's two reasons. There's a kind of curriculum related reason and then there's a general reason. So the general reason for me is that I think this idea of the ability to, to see things from different perspectives is like a crucial ability that we need to, to live and to kind of live peacefully and um, uh, in a world that's so full of conflicting opinions and so anything that's out there that's helping us to get better at doing that and to be able to step outside our own point of view and consider things from a different point of view I think is is worth doing um and there's yeah game designers would would call our game um genre probably like a persuasion game or an argumentation game okay. and there's other games out there like that um which we looked at some of those when we were designing the game. Um, there is such a, I think it's such an important genre of game, but it's actually really difficult to execute as we discovered when we started building the game. Um, and then in, in terms of curriculum itself, I think, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, like curriculum is a, is, is a political construct, really. It's, you know, it's a, um, a, a document or a kind of agreed understanding of what we think learning and teaching might look like, but it is trying to achieve many different things. And there's lots of different um, ideas and ideologies that are all kind of meshed together in the curriculum documents that we've got. And so understanding that, um, that process of construction of curriculum is actually a process of politics and compromise and different points of view and figuring out how to kind of, you know, get some agreement across those different points of view. So yeah, the digital game kind of mirrors that, that idea. And I think that's something that some students take away from the game. Like they, they've never thought that actually, you know, there's people out there that have debated and thought through, you know, or argued what kids should be learning at school. They just, you know, for them, most of their everyday life, they just assume somebody's, somebody knows, you know, what it mm. is that they're supposed to be doing or, you know, perhaps they think their teachers have decided. I don't know. How many teachers have, or have you encountered any teachers who haven't really thought about that, the debate and the, that would have gone into a curriculum document? Yeah, well, I think unless you are, uh, unless you've done any work in that space yourself or you've read um, research that's written about the construction of curriculum documents, you probably aren't, you probably don't really think about that. Or th um, yeah, and I, I guess my exposure to it, like I said, comes from having worked in that space in the you know, development of New Zealand curriculum and looking at what was going on with the 90s curriculum. And so I was actually kind mm. of had a window into some of those debates. And of course, you know, if you read literature around yeah. curriculum theory, that sort of stuff comes up all the time. But, yeah, you know, if you're not living in that world, then, you know, you probably don't really have a chance to kind of think about it. I remember accidentally upsetting a woman um, I did a postgraduate course, um, critical research methodology and education, I think it was called. So some pretty nerdy stuff. And I um, can't remember how it came about, but I said to her, well, who wrote the curriculum? Like, why are they right? And all of a sudden it was like, I don't know what happened for her, but it was like a whole face dropped and it was this, well, 
but actually there's other stuff beyond it, which was quite an interesting experience for me in that moment. She got a bit mm. huffy with me after that, which in itself was interesting. But um, there is that real sense of having to step again, like you said, that sense of needing to step beyond our own perspective sometimes. And I think mm. for me, that's definitely one of the exciting things about the cricketing for the Future game. Um, so one of the other things I've been wondering about um, is through this process, so you've talked about you really enjoy learning, but the reality mm -hmm. is that every now and then we learn something and it pulls the rug out from underneath us. Um, I know people are making loads of fun of the Aero Dictionary, but um, there's a term mm -hmm. in there that I really, really like. It's a cognitive wobble. Um, so when you realize you're holding two opposing views and struggle to make sense of that in a deep and challenging way. So were there any moments for you that you, in, in this whole experience of dealing with curriculums and thinking about the future and putting those two together, where you experience a cognitive wobble where you had these major conflict struggling to make sense of them? And how do you deal with that at this level? Mm. I think probably because of the kind of work that I do, you know, that cognitive wobble is, is just part of the deal of, of being a researcher. So it's probably for me, it was more about, um, I think in the, in the translation of the role play game to the digital game, there was aspects of that translation into a different form that I really struggled with because I, I love the live role play game. I love that you can't predict what's going to happen and that the thinking that happens in the game is totally dependent on how people engage with the game and what comes up during that process. And there's something about that that for me is like, it's kind of magic, you know, because I, um, yeah. if I'm involved in running a game, you know, I walk away with new thinking every single time because it's it's like that's dynamic um and in the translation to the digital game we it was we couldn't really think of a way to um create the digital game in a way that allowed that same kind of you know unpredictable all content generated by the players so we've we've gone with a format that has more of the ideas like pre-constructed and so the player is sort of choosing between them. And I struggled a lot with that because I felt, um, as a researcher, like I, I said earlier today, when you're doing the thinking work and creating, you know, do, exploring yeah. the questions and creating stuff, you know, you're doing all of that hard, interesting thinking. And in the live role play game, that was passed over to the players and in the digital game, it felt like, you know, we were having to take back a little bit of that power again and, and doing the yeah. thinking. Um, and so I struggled for a long time and I felt like, oh, the digital game, it's like it's not achieving, you know, the th same thing that I wanted the live game to do. And um, But what I've learned is since we've put it out there and just kind of really um, asking people to give us feedback, critical feedback and, you know, what, what they liked about the game, what they didn't like. I've heard back from people so many useful, interesting, positive things about what they took from the digital game that I think I undervalued. Yeah. So it was a useful lesson to me to, again, just like, you know, give up control a bit more and, and not try and compare the two games. And, you know, I liked this about the live game. It doesn't have that in the digital game, but actually to appreciate um, what you can do with those different genres. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a bit of a thing coming through here and quite a lot of what you're saying um, around as you learn about things, um, so in this case the different genres, that actually part of navigating that wobble, if you will, um, is about actually starting to understand what those different perspectives offer. Yeah, and, and listening to people and seeking out... Um, different opinions you know to check your own opinion and I guess that's um that's a useful thing that I always I think I always encourage other people to do it and I try and do it myself mm -hmm. but I, I guess in, in the game design process I found um what were my 
pain points or what were my own personal things where I would I got stuck in my own way of seeing things and I needed to just let go of yeah. that hear what other people had to say so it's that um, that other perspective and stepping beyond our own again isn't it yeah the other thing that's cool about and I probably should mention mm -hmm. as well like we are now doing another little mini development cycle of the digital game so um I don't want to say too much because you know we want to surprise people with the cool new um dimensions to the game but a lot of that new development work is being directly informed by what people have been saying about the game, um, the first version of the game. So that loop of being able to sort of keep iterating on the original concept for the game and get yeah. it out there, get people playing with it, get their feedback, think about what they're saying and then use that to kind of do the next cycle um, is, has been a big part of this whole kind of game development story. Um, and again, that's another kind of transferable thing yeah. that I'm really trying to share out there with other people is that to engage in that highly iterative design process where you kind of have a big ambition of what you want to do, but how you get there is through like lots and lots of cycles of just giving stuff a go and, you know, going yeah. with your idea, getting other people engaged, um, getting them excited, getting their feedback and and kind of going and going and going that's very cool we're looking yeah. forward to seeing those updates mm. um just a reminder to everybody watching that um in a couple of minutes so in about two minutes um we'll give a chance for any questions from the audience so if you want to paste um put your questions either on the hangout page or through twitter um i'll be looking at both of those for any potential questions you might have for rachel um so while you've got some any potential questions putting those in um rachel is there any one thing or a key message or a question that you hope people take away from not just curriculum for the future but your work in working with futures and curriculum and this future focus space that so many of us are attempting to navigate um <clears throat> Yeah, like I, as I said before, like I probably, this is the thing I struggle with. I never want to narrow mm -hmm. things down and say there's one takeaway because I think, you know, people will take yeah. what they need or take what they're ready for. Um, but I guess, yeah, my contribution into this space is, you know, like I've built on the work and the thinking and the, the awesomeness of, you know, other people, um, you know, including Kerry Facer, who you webinared with last week. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of her work. And I think, you know, all of us that are really interested in working in future-oriented ways, I think we all kind of bang on this message about, you know, the future is inherently unknown and unknowable. And the only reason to really deeply think about it, engage with it, is to shift and shape how we think about our actions in the present mm -hmm. um and so in my approach to that to work in that space i think has been built around the idea of like the the inherent uncertainty of the future invites creative responses and so um yeah i'd like people to sort of see my game and the work that I do and, and the way that I approach that futures work. And if they can kind of see that creating the conditions for creative responses to the future is a way mm -hmm. forward for them and how they are engaging with these, you know, uncertain, unknowable ideas. Um, yeah. You know, then that's perhaps something that they can take away from it. And not everybody um, will want to work in those ways, but um, that's what kind of excites mm -hmm. me. And that's what I want to share with, people out there I think there's also some interesting parallels for me around often when people talk future focused education they throw that creativity word around but it's often an association with things like entrepreneurship but actually that creativity is so much more than starting a business to make some money mm -hmm. um, 
although that's great my own family are I mean that's how I manage all their chat stuff is knowing all the business stuff that my family taught me growing up so I'm very grateful to that but certainly that creativity it extends far beyond just on the entrepreneurial um, one question here um, from what I can see um, from Michael um, he's asking as the future is unknowable what is the danger in the game of only focusing on certain concepts in education? I guess it's, you know, the, the ideas that are in the game are not the full complete set of ideas that could be contemplated around the future of education. They are designed to kind of spark a conversation and where that conversation goes um, may be informed and guided by all sorts of other thinking or reading or resources or um, the, the things, the issues that are really pressing and important to the people having the conversation. So, yeah, so I guess, I guess the danger could be that people sort of accept what might be in the game as like these are the only kind of future concepts we're thinking about, you know, because a research organisation has created the game and the researchers know what the future is going to be well researchers don't know what the future is going to be um but I, I think that the way that we talk about the game the way that we encourage people to engage with it hopefully steers them away from from viewing it in that way yeah yeah um so just a final question then from me um oh hang on i think we've just got another the one here um rachel i love that you remind us that curriculum is a political construct how do you think we as teachers can challenge that construct so that we have space to rethink and redesign curriculum? Well, I so think... I can read that one again if you like. No, I, I got the question. Um, cool. I think part of that is in sort of taking, you know, taking one's own um, agency, whatever you want to call it, to sort of taking ownership of you know, saying I am a curriculum designer. If I am helping to shape the opportunities that people have to learn, then I am a curriculum designer. Therefore, um, you know, curriculum documents or how schools plan their curriculum, all of that is open for negotiation in, from my point of view. So, yeah. Um, and if you look at New Zealand curriculum document, there's so, there's like a thousand hooks to hang your hat on. You know, and so it's actually about interpreting and reading the curriculum from a rich kind of thinking point of view. It actually allows you to explore the possibilities um, within it, not just kind of accept it as a statement of, you know, knowledge to be covered or, you know, this is what this subject is all about. And there are some pretty powerful examples out there now. Um, of various schools across the country have really played with the New Zealand curriculum in its current form, isn't there? Mm. Yeah, and I think the schools that are doing that or have been able to do that, it's because they've been able to create the time and space to have those deep, purposeful conversations around, you know, what, what they're trying to achieve as a school and what their students and their community needs and wants. And... Um, I think the biggest danger at the moment in education is that that time and space gets is getting squeezed down. And if we don't have the, you know, those opportunities, then I think the easiest thing to do is to kind of revert back to um, just receiving the curriculum as it, you know, just doing it rather than thinking about it and constructing it. Yeah. Hmm. I think that's probably a good point for us to um, wrap up. Are there any final thoughts from you, Rachel? No, I, I love what you're doing with the Ed NZ MOOC and it was really <laughs> lovely to be invited to um, contribute and I'm really enjoying um, lurking and sometimes contributing and really encourage other people to get in there and yeah, so you've created some really cool conditions for, I think, for people to do that creative thinking and responding. So well done, you. Thank you. And I do um, encourage people, even if you don't write anything down, the MOOC was actually designed so that you could lurk as well or that you could just drop in and do a week because you're interested in this bit. 
because um, there's, I think, um, I, that's why we've made the webinars public as well, rather than just based in the MOOC, so that people can take what they like and look, and there might just be something for everyone in there, let's hope so. I've certainly tried to cover as wide a base as possible. Um, just so, um, you mentioned, sorry, that's me. Um, you mentioned before um, this idea of those really deep conversations that needs to happen. Um, there's a couple of events that um, people might be interested in. Um, edge work, um, if you search for edge work AUT, but I can pop the link on the Hangout page as well. A um, couple of opportunities coming up. The role play game um, is being played at the um, one of the edge work workshops on the 25th, I think. And there's also a working with dissonance um, workshop that's coming up where the specific focus is on those conversations, those deep conversations that we really need to have if we do want to play and be creative with our curriculum, um, some professional development around how how can we actually have those conversations. So I think to really need further opportunities. So I think for those of us who are ready and excited to engage with rethinking curriculum and how we engage with it, there's certainly a whole lot of opportunities available. Cool. And so um, I think on that note, we'll wrap up for the evening and um, thank you everybody for joining us. We'll keep the webinar, um, the video available for you to keep watching afterwards and also for you to share it with any colleagues. Thank you very much, everybody.